This video has annotations for extra clarity and detail. Over the last few years, particularly when I started releasing videos about Fantasy Flight Games, Star Wars role-playing, I've been asked by quite a few people if I would do a video about how, as a player, to narrate or describe things in an interesting or exciting way. And while that information is a part of other videos, there really isn't a, an explicit video on the topic. Well, this one will try to be. It's not going to answer all the questions, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, the, my best advice is to simply do it, to practice, to think about uh, what it is that you like about Star Wars, that, you know, the visuals of Star Wars, and how you want to translate your imagination of those events into words. Words that match your character and words that build within the scene. Now, if that sounds complicated, it should. And it's something that's worthy of practice. It's complicated, but it's not hard. But it becomes hard. It can be made hard. It can be made to not be fun. And I think that's really the reason why so many people ask me about this. It's not that they're unable to describe the cool things that are happening in a scene. It's that they're worried that they won't be able to. Or, in you know, friction created with trying to describe something and being disappointed by what the game system will allow, uh, they have lost enthusiasm in some way. And so I'd like to identify three areas that I believe contribute to being stressed or worried uh, not having much fun, losing enthusiasm for, or, or in some other way, being uncomfortable with narration. Okay, what are those three things? They are, in no particular order, premature imagination, which we talked about before on the channel, but maybe not in relationship with Star Wars, system versus description, and the pressure to make description interesting. Those three things are barriers to fun. And so this video will start out by talking about those. Let's start with make it interesting. The pressure to make it interesting. It's a game. It's supposed to be fun. And if you're being put under pressure by yourself or someone else in the group to, you know, to get into it more, to be more de descriptive, and it's not happening for you, that has to stop. So make it stop. Take yourself aside and talk to yourself or, uh, talk with the group, but no, it's a game. No pressure. You will, of course, want to make your description interesting because these things feed on each other. One interesting description leads into another. But not all scenes are epic, nor should they be, and not you know, every description of every action needs to be poetic or somehow inspiring. It needs to contain the right information. It needs to have hooks into the, the next action and that sort of thing. And that's it. Sometimes a person just walks down a hallway. But sometimes they walk down a hallway exuding an emotion. Right? Feeling, displaying, threatening. What are they doing? Attuning yourself to what is actually happening and what needs to be described to convey that on whatever level you want to convey it, whether explicitly, he's angry, or implicitly, his fists are shaking as he walks. That's something to practice and develop over time and enjoy doing. For some people, description is easy. For some people, it's hard. Doesn't matter. Practice will help you improve. As long as your description includes the important details that will help the next player uh, start their description and that are rela relating the information that was revealed by the dice, then you're fine. 
take the pressure away and realize that this is a game based in communication and your primary role is to communicate what has happened and how. The dice help you do that. The dice come first. And that brings us to the second aspect, system versus description. There are some people who have experience with systems where there are so many details involved, and there's usually a uh, tactical setup involved with miniatures and grids and things uh, when this happens, but imaginations are carrying the scene forward and the system is butting up against those imaginations so that eventually someone, you know, rolls some kind of critical and goes, oh, it'd be awesome if I could do this. And then people realize that according to the system, that can't happen. Well, this is going to happen less often in this game, especially if you get in the habit of playing this game as this game, not importing previous habits. And this is a game that puts the system up front and allows the narration to follow. And if you go through the checklist, if you're doing a combat, for example, there's an actual step-by-step -step checklist of things to do. And you'll note that narration follows application of the rules. The die pool itself is built from all the things that are being contributed to the action. Then the dice are rolled, and the results are revealed. And you're narrating from the results. So there shouldn't be a case where suddenly you get this fantastic idea for some outcome and then the dice rob you of it or the system itself robs you of it because you've built the die pool to determine success or failure from whatever has been involved in creating that situation in the first place. As long as you get in the habit of doing that, as long as you get in the habit of narrating what each aspect of that die pool is about, then the resulting narration is all tied together. So where we can run into problems is if people are unfamiliar with their gear or unfamiliar with their abilities, so that you have this fantastic description of lining up a shot and blowing up a TIE fighter only to realize that you weren't actually in range because you forgot or didn't know what the range was in your X-Wing's weapon systems. And that's kind of frustrating. So being familiar with your character and what they can do is among the first steps that you should be taking as a person playing a new game. So, you know, that's nothing new. But its role in what you can and can and cannot narrate and its effect on how the system allows you to build narration is very important and should not be underestimated. And that brings us to the final stage of things, premature imagination. Going too far with what you're imagining the outcome of the scene to be and announcing it prior to the role. This also cannot work. So with these three things, stress or pressure to perform at a higher level, a more dramatic level or whatever, a more immersive level, the failure to harmonize system with your narration and the failure to harmonize with the scene in that you have allowed yourself to Imagine an outcome before the dice are rolled. These things all lead to confusion or discomfort as someone who has to describe something. Getting rid of those makes everything else a lot easier. But then you're left with the problem of, what do I actually say? So, let's get down to the meat of this video. What can I say? What can I actually say? And what should I not say? Fortunately, the way that this game works, the way that we build pools, it's got your back. It's telling you what you can say. It's telling you what you are responsible for describing and what someone else is responsible for describing. And it's limiting that to specific elements, right? Such as your skill or your characteristic, right? How agile you are versus your knowledge of firearms. It's also telling you when 
by its order of operations, things need to be described. Right? So intentions set up contributing factors before the role and outcomes after the role. So it's guiding you through the narration process piece by piece, step by step. And it's, like I said, it's got your back. It's keeping you from crossing the line into things that aren't for you to decide. Right? Before the role, we're not talking about outcomes. After the role, we're not really talking about intentions anymore. We're talking about effects. If it's dice that you are contributing to the pool, you're the one who's supposed to be describing them. If it's someone else that's contributing, such as you know, the assistance of another character, it's up to them to narrate what that assistance is and how it contributes those dice. The Game Master is likewise responsible for describing how difficult it is, why it's that difficult, and so on and so forth. Then the roll comes and we narrate the surviving dice, the outcome. But what can I actually say? Well, if you're just starting out, I firmly believe that talking about the system as its system name right, is a good idea until you've got it memorized and then stepping away from that. And I find that often people don't step away from that. They just talk system at each other. Uh, like, I do five damage or I do six damage. What does that mean in terms of something that I can imagine? Nothing. It's important information that I need to know, but it is not in and of itself description. It's just a statement of of system information. So, do both as a beginner, or do both if you're trying to rework uh, the way that you describe things. State it out, just as sim system information, as baldly as possible, and then dress it up with description. Fill your mind with what that would look like on the screen. Right? Was enough damage done to destroy the tie? Then describe its destruction. Was it only damaged? How? Were there advantages left behind that you could apply as negatives onto this ship? Is this ship going to act next? Can you apply uh, setback dice to it by, by using your advantages? Well, then maybe you can describe how it's having difficulty flying or something. Whatever. Turn the raw system information into visual description. Right, so leading up to the role, talk about intents. Talk about how your pilot is focusing, how they're being rocked in their seat by the maneuvering that you're doing. Describe, you know, trying to line up those sights. Not every time, but enough of the time to remind us of all those times when it happens in the films. Right? What are you doing? Right? Are you hesitating over the triggers? Are you depressing the triggers too soon? Are you just hanging on to them and trying to strafe across the target? Think about your actions. All of this stuff before the roll. What are your intentions? How are you going about it? Is there any help coming from outside? And those people contribute that information. Then the dice are rolled, the dice are sorted, and you know the outcome. This is cosmic dust now. It's gone. So describe that detonation. Describe maybe flying through the explosion or cutting around it or whatever. Make a visual. Just keep it short. Keep it snappy. Include all the information from the roll. Look at the surviving dice in the roll and go through in order. The Game Master is going to be contributing if there are any threats or if there are despair symbols left over. Otherwise, it's on you. And you're just describing what's in that dice pool. No further outcomes are yours to narrate. That's for other people, so don't worry about them. Just describe the result of the role, whether that's trying to inspire someone with your words or trying to coerce someone into doing something via your intimidating demeanor, right? Or if it's space combat. What can I say? The dice tell you exactly what you need to say, 
and who's responsible to say it and when it needs to be said. A concern that people have when, you know, trusting just their imaginations or notes is that they might forget something or someone during the combat. How many ships were there? How many ships were destroyed? Which one are you firing on? And that sort of thing. And it becomes, I'll shoot the one that he shot, or which one is damaged? I'll shoot it, and things like that. Things which, at least from my point of view, drain away the opportunities for interesting narration. So that's what puts the, the onus on both the player and the game master in the scene to create hooks, hooks for memory, easy hooks for description and reference, and of course, cool description. One thing that I find usually happens in an abstract combat system when people are going to have a space battle, there's this feeling that there needs to be counters or a map or a hex grid or something. I'm not sure really where that comes from. It could just be habit from you know, war games and things, but this game doesn't need them. And when you're playing through the system as it's set up, the miniatures and things will actually get in the way. Now, you can use miniatures as a representation, you know, a little icon so we can know which ship is which or, or how to imagine what the ship looks like, and then place it on a tracker, like a range tracker, that sort of thing, uh, or an initiative tracker to keep track of which ships have acted and which ones haven't, which ships have been destroyed and which ships haven't. But a representation of ranges and, and distances and relative positions is not going to work. It's not going to work like we want it to. And we'll end up spending more time fiddling with it than creating those awesome descriptions that we want. So while I really love tactical simulations of space games and have a ton sitting just above me right there, it's either do that or play this abstracted system. They don't mix very well. So what do we do? We have to remember that closing so that you can fire, this is purchased with a maneuver. And jockeying for position to get advantage over the target, this is paid for in in actions. You know, you these are all things that you're doing, things that you need to remember are part of your palette of choices and things that you're going to dress up with cool description. So let's say we're going to have an engagement between starfighters and there are capital ships present and we've zoomed in on the starfighters. They're what we're really paying attention to. And from time to time, the game master is going to insert description about what's going on with the capital ships. But in these examples, because this clip is already immense, I'm not going to do that. But just keep in mind that that would be happening. So we have the, the game master running TIE fighters and they're screaming in and we have the players in X-Wings and Y-Wings and they're, they're cruising in in formation and they're going to meet. They're being directed. They don't have sensor packages that enable them to see each other until they are basically within combat distance. So there's a lot to play with there in terms of description, right? You're receiving telemetry, you're receiving information, but your visuals, that's, you know, the blackness of space, the twinkling of stars, and the, you know, whatever you can see of the other people in your formation. And you are ripping in at impossible speeds, you know, following the instructions of, you know, the controller of your wing. You know, what do they have in mind for you? Once you've engaged, there's no time for this kind of discussion. It's, you know, kill or be killed. It, the control switches to you, but there's a lot of, you know, intentions and mental space that can be, that be, can be explored on the way to that engagement. It's not something to just kind of gloss over and you close the distance. So imagine a case with one X-Wing pilot and one player playing his astromech droid 
they're being pursued by two ties. Now, the two ties, they've got a great visual of the fleeing X-Wing. The X-Wing, of course, is jockeying for position, moving around, trying to get a, a sensor lock, get a sense of where they are, trying to move around. In game mechanics, he's trying to gain the advantage. The TIE Fighters are also trying to gain the advantage. Eventually, somebody's going to do it, and then they're going to need to try and retain it. Now, having the models sitting in front of you like this, it has an effect on the mind. We tend to think of the TIEs as being behind the X-Wing, and the X-Wing being in front of the TIEs and running away. All of this in a straight line. Combat in Star Wars never looks like that. Even with the Millennium Falcon. It's rolling all over the place and constantly changing direction. What we focus on in terms of the attack is the range in between them. The range that you've purchased with your maneuvers and your actions being able to launch an attack without receiving an attack, uh, just being able to attack, just being in range, just getting out of range so you can't be fired on. All of these things are what matter, not where things are sitting on a table. So the effect that has on narration is that you have incredible freedom to describe what the pilots are doing. The pilots are, you know, banking, diving, ducking, rolling, twisting, coming around, lining up shots, losing shots, all of these things as long as they don't cross the boundary of what the die roll is going to allow is fair game and fuel for the next player to start their narration from. If none of the pilots in an engagement have gained the advantage over their target, then anybody is free to fire on anybody else providing they're in range. So it's not a case of an X-Wing being chased by a bunch of ties. It's an X-Wing diving in and between and around and being pursued and alternately pursuing those ties. When somebody finally gains the advantage, then everything changes. Then it becomes that desperate race to get away and try and break that lock. Space combat is incredibly dangerous. You're unlikely to be retrieved from the wreckage of your tiny starfighter, even if you survive the explosion. And these are fairly fragile craft, certainly what the Empire is flying. And think about that from the rebel pilot's point of view for a moment. They're going up against pilots who are willing to get into such an under-armored ship, you know, basically an eggshell in space. What kind of courage must they have? Or what kind of certainty in their skill must they have? We make lots of jokes about stormtroopers not hitting anything. We make lots of jokes about the Imperials. But those are jokes that we make outside of the universe. This is not represented inside of the universe. Right? These pilots, the ones assigned even just to the lowly tie, pose a significant threat. Game Master needs to play up the bravery, the almost suicidal commitment to their mission of the TIE Fighter pilots. And the rebels, to bring that to light, need to remember that the Imperials are the enemy, right? We are the plucky underdog. The rebels are not a bunch of terrorists flying around destroying a stable government, right? So when these two forces collide, right, the heroism of one versus this you know, intense commitment of the other. The precautions that the rebels take with shields and heavier armor versus the military industrial complex, uh, lowest bidder wins kind of approach of the empire, but knowing that there's practically unlimited resources on the side of the empire, those thoughts fill the initial moments of the engagement before everything is wiped away in the fight or flight life and death struggle of it all. Those coming into the game with a background in something like X-Wing 
are likely not used to considering the speed of the craft, but this is very important in how these combats play out. In X-Wing, when it's time to maneuver, the maneuver that you choose comes with a distance. You're using a template, and it might be a one or a two or a three or a four or a five or what have you, some sort of arc or shape or bank or turn. And speed and pilot maneuvering are all compiled into one thing. But in the role-playing game, the choice of speed determines how you can close or escape from your opponent. If I'm traveling at top speed, it will take me fewer maneuvers to travel much farther distances, and I need to determine what my speed is, and I need to build up to it, unless I have specific talents that let me raise and lower my speed dramatically. But those talents usually come with some sort of cost in strain for the ship. This is another element that needs to be role-played. The decision of what speed to travel, the decision about taking strain. And it's not something where you just use the system language and say, I'll take two strain and, right? You do that, as I mentioned earlier, when you're starting out, right? You walk through the system and then you narrate. So what does that mean, taking strain? Is it pilot strain? Is it system strain? Narrate those effects. Is it emotional stress, right? You think you're going too fast, or when those two ships come close together, you're only going to have a split second to fire. Are you good enough? Is that where the strain comes from? Or is this strain represented by being slammed back into your seat and hurled from side to side as you move for position, or, or, or find that hook in your pilot. And whenever you do something from a talent that causes strain or whenever you receive strain from something else or when you have to pay strain to take an additional maneuver or whatever, think about what it is, the physical and emotional toll of the strain and include that in your description. It might even be something like a hesitation about taking another life. So, we have all of these things to consider. How fast are we going to come in? How fast can we come in? What's the top speed of our slowest vessel? These are things that the pilots would know, although they would talk about them in different ways than we do. Make a decision early on about how you're going to talk about speed. Is the in-universe lingo going to be speed one, speed two, speed three? Or are you going to come up with, with something else? Go for it. Have fun. Use all of the system information to create your description. Then, we worry about where are the ships in three-dimensional space. Describe it, don't worry about it. During a round, we are not in a blow-by-blow, shot-by-shot combat system. We are in a period of time, we're in an exchange where things happen. And the dice, once they're rolled, they let you know the final outcome. So in any particular engagement, we might have a flyby where only one or maybe none of the opponents fired on each other. Maybe they both fired. Maybe they were curving around each other. They, the range in between them is paid for by maneuvers and it remains constant based on how those maneuvers are spent. The attitude or you know, the relative positioning in three dimensions of these ships, as far as the system goes, doesn't matter. It only starts to matter when you start getting into the dogfighting tactics, such as, you know, gaining the advantage, right? That allows you to be in a position where you can choose where your incoming fire goes you have, at least for a moment as you are maneuvering, the ability to have your fire rain down on a specific part of the opponent's vessel. They don't have that choice. 
and if you have decided then that you are firing on their rearward arc, they likely cannot fire back unless they have weapons that can reposition or are already pointing out in that direction. This becomes very interesting. This creates the tension that makes the targeted pilot desperate to get away, screaming over the comms for their, their wingman. Remember all of these things. Remember to bring all of this stuff in. What if you're out there all by yourself? You're the last one left or you were the only one. You know, where are you going to go for help? What's it going to be like? Are you just going to tough it out and hope that the ship survives when this thing, you can't even really see it and it's, it's always just right behind you? What are you going to do? This is a great mental space to occupy before the roll. Then after the roll, you deal with the aftermath. What is the damage doing to your ship? What is the strain doing to the pilot? It's good fun. So if you follow this advice, if you start by boldly stating the system information and then dressing it up with narration, eventually you're going to have to realize that you don't need that first step anymore. You just need the second step. Again, being sensitive to that is, is on you. Right? But eventually, everyone will be familiar with the rules. Everyone will have you know, memorized the rules, and none of this uh, will be up to doubt. None of this is something that you need to go through a checklist for. So then you can just drop it. You're going to be doing it in your head anyway, but instead it's going to be coming out as narration of your intentions and your, your way of doing the thing. So how can we make the language of the narration more interesting? Well, we have all of the films to draw upon. That's our, our visual language almost, except we only have our words when we're at the table. But we can still evoke that imagery. And I use that word on purpose because what I find many people will do is simply reference. They'll say, it's like that, or remember the scene when, or as so-and-so did in film X. This has me remembering. This has me listening to the player telling me a story. This has me trying to sort out which particular moment in which particular film has got them all excited. But what it doesn't have me doing is imagining what it is that they want me to imagine. So rather than referencing the films or the comics or whatever, and distracting me from your character with one of the characters from the films, instead evoke the imagery. Tell me what it looks like. Use whatever words you like. Simple, complicated, poetic, it doesn't matter. To activate my mind's eye. And you're doing the right thing. Let's go for an example. I could be in an X-Wing, but, but let's use the, you know, the rotating cockpit in the Falcon. And so, you know, our YT-1300 freighter is trying to escape from ties. And ahead of us is an Imperial Star Destroyer as a blockade. So obviously, I'm going to need to turn around. <laughs> I don't want to get within range of it. I'll need to be spending maneuvers. If it's closing on me... I need to be spending maneuvers to open that distance or keep that distance open long enough that I can jump to hyperspace. But I've got also these ties to deal with. Now, the ties are going to catch me regardless of what I do because of the ship that I'm in. So I'm going to focus on spending my maneuvers to get away from the Star Destroyer. And I'm going to be focusing my evasive maneuvers on dealing with the ties. But I'm really hoping that my gunners can just blow them away. Great. That's all system information. Right. So the Game Master is describing, you know, the Star Destroyer coming around. And I'm just describing trying to get away from it. And the guys who are playing the Gunners are describing trying to get a target. How can they do this? Well, someone could look at me and say, 
So this is just like when Luke is in the cockpit and, you know, the, the, the guns are, are ratcheting back and forth and, you know, he's, he's like lining it up and he's yelling at Han. It's just like that, right? So in, in no part of that description did he describe his own character or even this scene. Uh, I got, you know, a, a memory of the guns he's describing. I even got a flash of the sound in my ears, but I, I don't know what his character is doing. There's just this cat named Luke that he's talking about. I would much rather him describe how his character is in the seat, right? And how the, that mobility of that gun emplacement affects his character up against the straps. You know, are the straps biting into him? And what does it take to actually line up the crosshairs? And what does it feel like as the TIEs move across this field of vision? We know the TIE fighters are much, much faster than the Falcon. And we know they're whipping all around it. They're always within the range that they have purchased, right? They're always within close range or short range or whatever. And I know I've got, you know, short range weapons, let's say. I can hit them within that field of vision. But they're, as they arc around the ship, they're not always in my crosshairs. And I'll be taking multiple shots at them during this whole narration. Will I hit them? Will I not hit them? Who knows? I haven't rolled the dice yet. I'm describing my intentions to track them across my field of vision, to rotate the guns in order to keep them in my sights long enough to get off a shot that matters. That's the stuff that makes things exciting. And I don't have to talk a lot. I can just say, right, you know, the, the ties are whipping past my, my field of view faster than I can follow them. I'm trying to anticipate them each time they come around and, and track them up and to the right, but every time I do so, the, the, the strap's biting into my arm and, and pulling off the, the crosshairs. All right. Is it biting into my arm enough that someone wants to offer a setback die? You know, beating that setback die increases the tension. It's okay to include stuff in your narration that is not to your benefit, to imply something. But you're also describing your strategy, how you're trying to predict their movement, and maybe that's worth a boost die. Or maybe by offering a negative and a positive, you're just adding interesting description, and neither a boost die nor a setback die will be added as a result of what you said. But the opportunity is there if people are listening and find it fun. But very clearly now is an image of the character wrestling with that equipment and trying to make a good shot. The dice get rolled. It's a hit. The quad laser cannon annihilates the tie. Right? So now I'm free. Now I can continue to build on that description of how hard it was. You know, tie whips through my field of view, and it's again following the same pattern. And I track up on them, and I shift in my seat to the left, which relieves the pressure on the strap, and the gun comes around, rising up, and the crosshairs flare green. And I let go with an extended burst. I might actually make a pew-pew noise. And the solar panels, <laughs> the, the panels fly off, the, the tie as the eyeball itself simply disintegrates into a gout of flame, lighting up the gun in which I'm sitting. But I'm not going to miss a beat. I'm going to look for the other one. Right. Now it's the next player's turn. I hit my target, and I've described this massive flare of light. They're on the bottom of the ship. I'm on the top of the ship. Do they see that flare of light? Right, And they can go on with their narration. One narration linking in to the rest. Game Master doesn't need to intrude except for dealing with any rolled threats or despair. Otherwise, it simply moves through initiative. Who's going to act next? And again, the players have it in their control other than for the villains. Who is acting next? Who does it make sense for to speak next, to narrate next? I hope this has been in some way helpful. 
Again, it really comes down to being comfortable both with yourself and the way you describe things and with what the system is providing for you to describe. Making that relevant to the other people and having fun. <laughs>